It's time for the Financial Crisis Talk Center with Ken Gross and David Einstandig from Fav Gross. Credit card debt is number one. I think, it, I view it as financial cancer. 40% of your gross income is going to just pay the debt service. You got no chance of getting out. I would give up my credit score to get rid of debt. Here's your host, Ken Gross. Good morning. Welcome to Financial Crisis Talk Center. We have a special guest today. This na- the word of the day is Detroit. Special guest in the studio with us is candidate for mayor, Sheriff Benny Napoleon. Hey, Ken. How are you? Good, Benny. It is a pleasure to have you with us this morning. My sidekicks, David Einstandick. Good morning, David. Good morning, Ken. Always nice to see you. I'm glad that you dressed up a little bit. For, uh, well, Benny. look who's talking. You wore a tie for for, for the sheriff. <laughs> I, I always got to one up you. I'm looking to see if you've got a badge there too. Uh, we can work it out. <laughs> Brian, I, Brian Small. Good morning. Good morning, Ken. Um, apparently, I didn't get the memo, but it's all right because I try not to wear sport jackets or ties. It it, it constrains my neck too much. Uh, well, I mean, you're you're in bright red, so it's going to show up well on the camera. By the way, I just want to remind everyone. This show will air on TV on October 13th and on October 20th. So this is a good chance for us to really get to know Benny. We're going to explore in this segment and the next segment his vision for the city of Detroit. Where are we going with the future of the city of Detroit? So if you want to catch this on the TV, it's on TV 20 at 11 o'clock a.m. That's when the... The Talk Center show airs on TV. It's every Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock, and this show, these shows will air on the 13th and the 20th. So before we get, you know, before we get into things too far along the way, I just kind of want to, I mean, although this is going to be dated when it's on TV, I kind of want to throw out a condolences uh, to the family of uh, the Gator. Gates Brown passed away yesterday, and, you know, he was, I mean, for those my people my age, I don't know about David and Brian, whether you guys were around. What about me, sure man? The sheriff. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> Benny, how old do you think Ken is? Uh, he knows the Gator, so he and I are about the same age. Uh, I think he's older than you, Ken. I, think I, I don't think older. so. Uh, no? How old are you? I'm 59. Oh, 58. All right. I know we're about I, the same I, age. I got him. Okay. Ken's like a fine wine. Uh, I mean, you got to get them horizontal. How, how so. great was the Gator? Oh, the Gator I mean, was the man. I mean, just actually, a, they tout him as the guy. greatest uh, pinch hitter of all time. Yeah. Do you know what his average was pinch hitting? Two seventy four. What? No, no pinch hitting. Uh, Two fifty one. Oh, okay. So it, it shows you how difficult it is to actually come in and pinch hit. Oh, yeah. I mean, you come in cold and you haven't swung the bat. You're not in the Florida game, and then they expect you to come and do the great things that get you out of trouble. Yeah. Sounds like the mayoral job. <laughs> <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever meet the Gator? Oh, yeah. No, uh, very well. You know everybody. Yeah. he. I, I used to talk to him uh, at length at uh, Comerica Park because when you come through from the parking structure on the second level, he used to sit there and sign autographs, plus uh, – he used to live next door to my chief of staff, Michael Turner. So I've known Gates for, for a long, a long time, time, man. Yeah. He just was always one of the guys that always made you smile. Great. He's man. kind of like, I think, the Vinnie Johnson of yeah, the Tigers. Yeah, that's, that's a good you know? analogy. Yeah. That's yeah, a great so, analogy. Yeah, just, just upbeat and kind of think, just you know, get people rallied and, and, and happy and everything. So, anyway, heartfelt condolences there. So, who's Benny Napoleon? I kind of want to. I kind of I tell you if you if you don't really know Benny well, there's one good way of getting a lot of information. You got a great website out there. Is it is it BennyNapoleon.com? Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I I went in there and you know right off the bat you know I, I kind of liked it. So you were working at Sibley Shoes out of high school. Actually, that was my co-op job, which is something I'm a strong believer in. I worked it while I was in high school, and it was a great. Uh, program because I worked it in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. When I graduated from high school on Friday, I was I had a job Saturday morning full time. So I didn't even have to look for employment. I, I didn't go to college right away. I took some time away from it. So it was a good thing because I walked right into a job that I'd been holding for a while part time. So that was in the days. Or I, I don't know if the sh- I think the shoe business is still the same where the salespeople are there and they're kind of lined up and there's kind of a batting order. When someone, a new person walks in the door. Did you sell shoes? Yeah. No, I've, I've been sold shoes. How's that? Uh, yeah, we used to call it whoever is up. So is that, it's exactly yeah. as you say. Because they hit you fast. You know, oh, you yeah. walk through the door. 
Yeah. yeah. You, it's kind of like, okay, you're next, you're next. Unless you have personal trade that comes in, somebody that comes in specifically looking for you. Yeah, and then and then and then when you say that to the guy who's up and he has to go back on deck, he kind of he kind of has a, a a disappointed look on his face. Well, no, you have to you have to prove you that this person it. really right. knew you. Oh, they yeah. have to walk in the door and say, "Hey, that's my guy. Come on." Yeah, you not, can't just say that's my personal right. trade. Don't work like that. It's not a laid back situation. <laughs> uh, huh? No, because yeah. we got paid on commission. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you that's a good point because I waited tables and Brian waited tables. I know you, uh, in our first jobs or initial jobs, being in sales on commission is one of the best proving grounds for life. Oh yeah, no you question. You only get paid if you perform, you got to perform well, you got to perform quickly. Yep. And you know, I would get people that would come in and before you even put the soup down, it's not hot enough. Oh, yeah. It's not hot enough. I said that's fine. I take it in the bag, I put it in the microwave for 6 minutes, I bring it out with Steve. gloves. With gloves. <laughs> Wait, and it still wasn't hot they enough. They had microwaves when you were a waiter? Yeah, they did. Oh, okay. They did. They've been around for a long time. Well, if I would have, would have been waiting, when you and I were out of high school, they didn't have microwaves. Well, you went to law school, kindergarten, and sixth grade all in the same building, so don't worry about it. Really? Well, it's like a big schoolhouse. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's that's, old. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, I, I was going <laughs> to say, man, that's highly unusual. But no, they did not have microwaves back in the day. We remember yeah. that. <laughs> Dave's a real young guy. Absolutely. A little whippersnapper. They didn't have MTV either, so how's, how's that? I mean, we weren't the MTV age. So you went. So you were working at Sibley's, and then you ended up getting recruited into um, the police department. When uh, Mayor Young got elected in 1973, I was 18 years old, and uh, right after that, he started uh, a big push to hire. Uh, young Detroiters to go into a police department that was not reflective of the community. He was trying to integrate uh, the department because when I uh, when I joined the department, the department was uh, like 90 percent majority with only 10 percent minority officers, and uh, the city of Detroit was about 50-50. So he wanted to have a police department that was more reflective of the plurality of the city of Detroit, and that's how I got in. He had this little catchy slogan, being a cop is more than just a gig. And I was walking down the street, they used to do the commercials, and it was purely by accident. They had a van right in front of the old Hudson's building, and the guy basically lassoed me into the van and said, come on in here, you're going to Oh, really? For yeah, man, I was on lunch break. I was 18, 19 years old, and the guy lassoed me into the to the van, and I started the process, and the next, rest is history. Next thing you know, you're in training, huh? Oh, yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. We're with Sheriff Benny Napoleon, candidate for mayor of the city of Detroit. I couldn't get out of the car. I couldn't run or exercise. I couldn't work. Dr. Lewis Radden believes that pain shouldn't have to wait. His Spine Specialist of Michigan is a comprehensive center dedicated to helping you manage pain now. Expect the latest techniques and personalized care. Why suffer another minute? He's the best. I tell people that he's the one that saved my life. Make your appointment with Dr. Radden. Call 248-792-9496. If your house is underwater, please listen to this important message. The rules have finally changed. We're seeing some great loan modifications with reduced principal, and short sales are easier to get done than people think. The biggest problems I see are people wait too long or they try and do it themselves. There are no second chances. If you're underwater in your house, call the experts. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. No one ever thinks that a serious injury can happen to them. But it can and it does. And it can happen to you. And when it does, you need a fighter in that courtroom for you. Call me. Ben Johnson, automobile accident, police misconduct, medical malpractice, product liability. You know what you're up against, how hard it is to get answers. When all you want is justice, call me, Ben Johnson. Whatever your legal crisis, I will fight for you. Call me today. Do you have tax problems, unfiled returns, facing levies on wages in your property? You need an expert, not a cartoon character or salesman. Thav Gross is your solution. You need to look at the big picture. That's what we do. We develop a plan that's right for you. I had major tax problems. I didn't know what to do. We did. We sat down together and solved your tax problem. No more letters, no more phone calls. They saved me. Call Thav Gross, 888-235-HELP. Going from hourly to salary seemed like a good career move, but now you're working 60 hours a week instead of 40, and you aren't getting paid any of that extra time. You're stuck, right? Wrong. 
you can be on salary and still be entitled to overtime. If you've been wrongly denied such pay, you may be entitled to that and more. Gold Star Law is here to help you through your employment law problem, whatever it is. Gold Star Law, protecting employees' rights. Call 1-800-WAGES-10 for a free consultation today. All right, welcome back. All right, so we're with Sheriff Benny Napoleon. We're kind of going through some history. I want to get your vision of the city. But So, so you, I ran out of high, high school from working at Sibley's. You get recruited in the police department, and then, boom, by 1995, at age 43, you've managed to... 98. 98? Yes. Okay. All right. You've gone to college. Yes. You've gone to law school. Yes. You've passed the bar. You're a lawyer. Yes. And you're pre- police, uh, you're, you're chief of police. Correct. That's a busy That's a busy uh, few years. Yeah, it's quite busy. I, in addition, I went through the FBI National Academy. I went through the United States Secret Service Dignitary Protection School. I did financial work at Wharton and leadership at Harvard. I was a busy guy. So I guess this the the pace of this campaign is probably slow for you compared to what you did when you were a kid. <laughs> it's not slow by you know? any stretch of the imagination. It's busy, but I'm used to being busy. Yeah, it's, I mean that, that's good. So at what point, all of a sudden, you go from Sibley Shoes, you're pulled into a van, uh, and recruited in the police department. When did you start thinking um, career, and not just career as a cop, but career as a doer as somebody who's going to make a difference in changing things i mean when you get to be chief of police you're supervising how many people at that time i had four thousand three hundred sworn officers in, in over a thousand civilians so they're about about 53 about 5300 people and about 400 million dollar budget let me tell you our firm thav gross we have about 25 employees <laughs> i've been managing it as best i can for about 50 25 years it is very difficult to keep 25 people from bickering, fighting, and getting mad at each other and keeping them on track. 4,000, that's a lot of people. And at 43, I mean, 43, if you're 22 years old, when I was 22, I thought 40 was old because I figured I was done when I got to 40. I'd be retired now. (laughs) But when you're 43, you realize that's really young. Yes, that's a lot. That's a lot on the table. It was uh, at the time I was the youngest major city police department in the country, and I used to go to the meetings with all these chiefs from around the country. We had, they have major uh, city chiefs, the top thirty chiefs in the country, meet twice a year. And I'd walk in, and I remember walking into the first meeting, and you can't sit if you are not the chief. And I remember walking into the first meeting, and all the guys were looking at me like, "What are you doing here?" I was like. I'm the chief of police in Detroit, and they like, really? It was funny. It was interesting. So they said, okay, you can stay seated. Oh, yeah. I, they, I could sit once right. they knew who I was, but it, before they knew who I was, they were like, you can't sit here unless you're the chief. I was like, I am the chief. It was pretty interesting. <laughs> that had to be fun. That it was. Fun. It was fun and funny. <laughs> so, all right. So from there, and in 2001, you retired from the police department. Yes. And then... Uh, next thing we know, you're Wayne County Executive in, in, in 2004. Assistant. Assistant. Yes. Right. Assistant. Okay. Good yeah. Bob's right now, the, probably. Bob's the exec. Right now, that's probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. <laughs> that's yeah, a, I was that's a whole other municipality we can dedicate a few shows to. Yeah, I was Assistant County Executive under uh, Bob Ficano, and I, I focused on uh, predominant issues related to uh, homeland security and some issues related to parks and some other things at the county. And what type of budget does the county executive have in Wayne County? His budget is a lot smaller than it was in the police department. I mean, the overall budget is a little over a billion dollars, but uh, he's not really responsible for the entire county budget because you have uh, independent elected officials who have their own budget, like myself. Uh, my budget is $80 million. That's what they give me, but it should be about 140 but that's another discussion. Uh so, I mean, he doesn't really have to manage that because the prosecutor manages her own budget, uh, as does the clerk and the, and the treasurer and the register of deeds. So the overall county budget is not his responsibility. But is, is it from a county executive's perspective, though, do they determine what those uh, individual budgets are going to be? Is there any input there? Oh, yeah, definitely. He's the person who has to say yay or nay on the budget. He has veto power and he has approval power. He, su- he submits the budget to the commission. The commission 
kind of scrubs it, then they decide what they want, then they send it back to him if he likes it. He says, okay, if he doesn't, he vetoes it, and then they have to get enough votes to, to, to override his veto and his budget. So that vote budget process, it's like crazy. It's a perpetual challenge. Every single year, once we finish a budget, we start working on the next budget, so it's like we're always in a budget Sounds cycle. like washing the windows at the rent end. Yeah, you never get finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good analogy. I'll, I'll For two reasons. One. There's a lot of windows and the, and the building circular. Right, uh, especially when they tell you to get the corner. <laughs> I can never find my way around there. Never, never, never have been able to handle. I'd that. like to find the guy who designed that building. <laughs> you just have to keep walking around in a circle. Eventually, you'll get to him. Yes. So, all right. So then, so, so you're sheriff now. You've been forced into a situation where you're dealing with budgetary problems. Yes. Uh, there, you're saying you need 120 million. You have 80. What? How do you deal with that problem? You, you really. You, you don't. I mean, I have a constitutional mandate, and you guys are lawyers, and you know uh, that when you have a, a constitutional mandate, you carry out that mandate. And I'm responsible for 2,800 people on average per day. I've budgeted for 1,800. So, you know, they say, well, deal with it. Well, you can't deal with it. I have to do some things like uh, feed the prisoners. I have to clothe the prisoners. I have to watch the prisoners. I have to give them uh, adequate medical care. I have to transport them back and forth uh, to court for their hearings in a time fashion so all these things are costly so you can't just deal with them and you all definitely know there are only three ways to get out of the Wayne County Jail you can serve your time you can bond out or you can be released on uh, electronic monitoring device at the direction of the chief judge of the circuit court outside of that I can't release anyone from the jail. So when I get 2800 I have to deal with the 2800 I can't pawn that off and say oh well I'm gonna let a thousand of them go. It's and not they, like a hotel. You no. put the no vacancy sign up. Yeah, I can't do that. You know, I can't. When 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 the court remands them to the jail, I have to keep them. So to 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 suggest that you know, okay, you got eighteen hundred, deal with it. I I don't but, I don't control that population. I, I would imagine that one of the hardest things to do is to maintain and try to strive to increase morale of your rank and file of your employees of your contractors of whatever it may be in any type of situation no question um, what have you found over over your vast experience managing big numbers and i want to get to it after the break some of the, some of the things that really have enabled you to try to maintain morale oh okay that's great yeah there's a, I, we're gonna we're gonna go into a break now when we come back i kind of want to walk through your vision of the city too. Okay. I want to. I want to kind of. We'll, we'll touch on, on on the jail, and then I want to get to where are we going with the city of Detroit. What's it going to be like post Chapter Nine and everything else? We're going to take a break. You like your job. What you don't like is the way your boss has been treating you. He's making comments about how you look instead of your work, and he's been touching you inappropriately. If you complain, is he allowed to fire you? Absolutely not. Unwelcome sexual comments, advances in contact are illegal in the workplace. Make him pay. Gold Star Law is here to help you through your employment law problem, whatever it is. Gold Star Law, protecting employees' rights. Call 1 800 Wages 10 for a free consultation today. Every family has the family meeting. And we all know what that means. Dad's got dementia. What are we going to do? What's the care plan? that the family has in place. Usually they don't or they struggle with a care plan. When you go home tonight and you talk to your tax person and you talk to your financial person and say, what's the plan that you have in place? And as soon as they don't give you an answer, give me a call because I can do it for you. Financially strapped, do you want to save your home? It's all about preserving future income. Bankruptcy is one option. When it's right, it's the least costly, most effective way to save your home, eliminate a second mortgage, and wipe out credit card debt. But you need to address the problem now. We help people with bankruptcy. Call the experts. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. Double action. Shooting center and gun shop. For the largest selection of guns, accessories, and ammunition. Double action is your only pro gun shop. And now you can train with the best in our basic CCW course. With the most comprehensive curriculum, the best resources, and most accomplished staff. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. Double action is the only place to get your CCW or renewal. Double action. We're on DeQuinder and Madison Heights. 
No one ever thinks that a serious injury can happen to them, but it can and it does, and it can happen to you. And when it does, you need a fighter in that courtroom for you. Call me, Ben Johnson. Automobile accident, police misconduct, medical malpractice, product liability. You know what you're up against, how hard it is to get answers. When all you want is justice, call me, Ben Johnson. Whatever your legal crisis, I will fight for you. Call me today. All right, welcome back. We're with Sheriff Benny DePoin is running for mayor, and we're getting to know him this segment and the next segment. Before we get back to the topic that we're talking about, I just want to cut a couple quick announcements. We have a seminar coming up Tuesday, October 23rd, or Wednesday, October 24th. You can pick either day. It's called Secrets to Resolving Your Financial Challenges. Mm. We cover all the issues, underwater house, um, loan modification, all the things that we talk about on the show week to week. Debt People, settlement. Debt settlement, uh, bankruptcy, Brian's our bankruptcy expert, talk, talks about those issues. But the whole focus is on a go-forward basis. You want to preserve your future income. You want to get rid of your debt so that when you, re when you get to retirement, you've got something there. So you're not sitting there worrying about your Detroit pension, which you're going to be worrying about probably for a while. And you're worrying, you, you need more than Social Security. You need to have some cash in the bank. So that's what we talk about um, and we'll come back to that more in, in the next segment. I want to thank our show sponsors, Ven Johnson Law, Gold Star Law, Samasco Law, Double Action Shooting Range and Gun Shop, Spine Specialists in Michigan. I also want to let people know we've got a couple new sponsors coming aboard. I'm always excited about that. Cardiology Associates of Michigan. They're in Roseville and Shelby Township. Dr. Mark Zania, Dr. Michael Castillo, Dr. Nancy Messia, and Dr. Mohamed Juma. They are fantastic cardiologists. I know them all personally. They are great people. And we also have Elite REO Services, uh, Alan Stalter. He's uh, what we think to be the best short sale uh, real estate broker in town, and we use him and work with him all the time. And he, he's coming on board as a sponsor as well. And I always want to thank our gift certificate sponsors, although we're not giving any gift certificates out today, uh, for Johnny Pomodoro's and also uh, Detroit Popcorn. So when we came into the break, David, you, you, were, you were going to ask the sheriff a question and you ran out of time about what, what were you focusing on? Yeah, I just wanted to get a sense. Uh, we know that budgets are always getting decreased. There's a lot of uh, pressure to cut costs but to deliver. And how do you maintain morale when you're governing 5,000, 50,000, or soon to be 700, 800,000 people? What types of things have you seen over your career that, that will really enable people to get, get together, that have confidence in you as a leader, and, and what's your take on that? You know, I took, um, I, I studied organizational behavior under a guy named Nick Parisi at Northwestern University. And one of the things that he uh, stressed to me as a young supervisor coming up through the ranks in the Detroit Police Department was take care of your people and they'll take care of you. And when, when, when people inside an organization really believe that you have their best interests at heart, they know that sometimes you can't give them more money, but when you can create a working environment that is really conducive uh, to people wanting to be there and it's not uh, inept or uh, tyrannical type leadership, they'll come to work, they'll come to work happy, and they'll work through some things, and especially if you're communicating to them uh, what the issues are and give them a vision, show them at some point you're gonna get out of this if you work together, that uh, the circumstances they're in are temporary. So it really comes down to having the ability to lead people. And the other thing that he, he taught me very clearly is the quickest way to fail is to try to please everybody because you can't do it. Yeah, I, that's, that's I have a, a question point. for you. If, if, if the best way to deal with things is to lead people, and yet you're dealing with constrained budgets and they're getting smaller and smaller, how do you, again, maintain a sense of community within your rank and file of, of officers at the same time telling them, I'm sorry, but you've got less to work with, less to work with, less to work with, and by the way, 10 of you are being terminated at the end of this month. It's tough. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, getting rid of someone uh, because of budget problems is one of the hardest things in the world for any a manager to do. I just did it in, in, in the county. I got rid of eight of my appointees, people that I've been working with for four years, and I really liked them as people. They were part of our, our internal family, but the fact is I had to make a tough decision. I had to get rid of some folks, yeah. and you sit them down, you talk to them, and let them know, hey, this is just how it is. We appreciate the work you've done, and then you do what you can to help them find future employment, and that's the best you can do, and people understand that. It's a good segue to go back to, all right, May, your vision as mayor, your vision for Detroit as mayor of Detroit. Okay. What do you, what do you see? What 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 what's the first thing that comes to mind in terms of 
what it, what's the biggest thing you've got to accomplish the quickest in we, the city of Detroit? Uh, that's easy. We First of all, we know we have to get our finances in order, but that's really out of uh, anybody's hands because we now have an emergency manager that I think is unconstitutional personally, but... Uh, then we have the bankruptcy court, and you guys know that once you go into bankruptcy, the bankruptcy judge is controlling almost everything. So uh, the the issue at that time becomes now creating Detroit as a safe city, uh, transforming this city that has been on the national consciousness and on the national uh, discussion table is one of the most dangerous cities in America and oftentimes the most dangerous city. So until we affirm Detroit as a safe city and people start believing year after year after year that we're not a discussion when it comes to violent crime, people will uh, people will start believing that we have turned the city around from a crime perspective, and you will start seeing people say, "Hey, that's a place I want to live." Not just downtown and midtown, because that's a small segment of uh, the city of Detroit square miles. We need people to believe. We need people to say, like my 26 year old daughter with a six year old son, to say, "I want to live in Detroit in the neighborhood because." I can have a safe neighborhood and do have a safe neighborhood. I can educate my child in this system. There are opportunities. There's no longer blight. That's what we have to do to change this community. So we need to, how, how do we get there? Well, I have a square mile initiative that, uh, first, of all, first and foremost, I've done it. Uh, I reduced crime uh, during the time that I was chief of police for three years. My crime reduction strategy was put in place after much discussion, uh, after about six months in office, and we do reduced crime over 30% during the time that uh, that I was the, the, the police chief. So we have proven techniques to reduce crime. It's community policing, crime prevention, problem-oriented policing, directed enforcement, and a data-driven approach to crime. Those are all terms of art in police work, but the fact is when you put those five things together in a solid plan with the right people, you'll start seeing your crime rate uh, dip, and it'll dip significantly by doing some very simple things. A, teaching people how not to be a victim. That's the crime prevention aspect. The community policing is getting the police and the citizens involved in making their city safe. And then the data-driven, directed enforcement approach is criminals have a predator trail. And they do what they like to do. We all are creatures of habit. And if I'm a if I'm a a, a, a carjacker, I'm going to carjack because I like walking up to somebody, putting a gun in their face, taking their car. If I'm a B and E man, I put a I put something in my pocket, breaking your house under stealth. If you're going to do it, you might as well be good at it. Huh? That's the way they do it. So they don't they're they're one dimensional. So once we track these people, get their uh, crime patterns down, the quicker you arrest them, the fewer people that get victimized. Stop and frisk. What's what, what's your take on that? You guys are lawyers. You know that the Supreme Court has said Terry versus Ohio. You have to have reasonable suspicion, not just random stopping people. You can't do that because we have a constitution. In Absolutely. Our All right. Thank Sheriff Cohen for being with us on this segment. He's going to be back and staying with us in the studio for the next segment, and we're going to get into in the next segment some of the financial issues for the city of Detroit. I want to get your take on those issues. Figure out how we deal with them once we get out of that Chapter 9 bankruptcy. We'll be back after the break. You're listening to the Financial Crisis Talk Center. Stick with us. 